Hi, Hi. Good one. I'm all right. I brought no cookies. What? <laughs> I've been running around all day. All right, right. <laughs> so next time you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, we have like cookies just to go to this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to pass out notepads? I think we're good. Um, I didn't bring the notepads. Oh, that's good. I thought I'd serve it. Oh, okay. But if you want, next time I'll be sure and bring them for you. Well. I know it's handy, but I'd say no, it's not. Unless there's a paper. Nobody really used them. Yeah, but, but yeah. you can sure do that. I just set them aside. Try not. It's um, okay. So and, and this is Assemblywoman Neil. This is Gabby and Angela from the city clerk's office, and they're going to be working with us. Hopefully, it won't be too bad. And uh, <laughs> hi, oh hi, and uh, Councilman Weekly or Commissioner Weekly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Jeff was just told me he's not going to be here, right? Right, Commissioner Weekly. Yeah, I think that's the only one. And Barlow. He just called. Yeah. Oh, did he call him? Yeah, yeah, but we still have a quorum. Okay. So, um, and, uh, this, what is it? Member Boyd, she's going to be on it, calling in. Yeah, calling in. And then, and, uh, and Chandra yeah. calling in, and then she will show up. Okay. So she'll be calling in on a drive in. Okay. And, um, so good. as long as we don't lose the quorum. Right. How many? So we need six. We need five. We have nine, so five, right? Um, yes, five. So yeah. we need five. We have five. Okay. Okay. Kelvin. Kelvin. Yep. Mr. Hammer has to leave at six, four, That's five. five. And and just, yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, is going to be here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be, this isn't going to be a long thing, because we don't have F Street. Right. So, I think it's going to be We don't have F Street. So, there can't be anybody just complaining. Why is she here? Oh, okay. Oh, you do the minutes? Yeah. Clients now before the last so they respond. Okay. No, I know it's just. No, actually, Yeah, it's just. Welcome, whatever you okay. want to say since the first meeting. All right. Well, okay. Yeah. So I think that works. So I'm going to do roll call. Okay. And if you just want to announce those that are going to be absent. Okay. You know, excuse. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thank you. I put this... Put everybody's spot with that sexual list. Okay, so that good. I didn't know, so I thought I'd throw it in there. Okay, so have it. that'll be good. And they did uh, retweet all that stuff. Oh, you asked for it. Okay. 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 You know, it's like right after we talked, somewhere around 2 o'clock or something like that, I believe I saw the tweets. Okay, good. That's good. Hi, Dr. Young. Hi, how are you doing? I'm all right. Neil, how's that woman deal? Hi, hello. So, you ready for Thursday? Yes. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be ready for Thursday. Okay, um, And I'll get there a little yeah. early. I'm going to do a little PowerPoint because I have 10 minutes. Yeah, so we're going to be able to load you up. Yeah. yeah, I'll get there a little early so I can take care of them. Okay, because okay. we just have two. Jason, Jason and you are doing PowerPoint. Okay, okay. Well, that's good. I mean, I just got, uh, I got a nice document I want to get to everyone and it's online. It's through the Food and Company. It's called a time to change. Do you want, do you, 
Are you printing it through your office, or do you need me to get it printed? It's printed. It's printed. It's printed. It's printed. It's printed. Oh, so I don't have the electronic one. Oh, okay. So, so do you want us to, like, maybe... Um, it's, it's good for people to have that. Because if we have a link, right? Yes. We could, Debbie's printing the agenda, maybe we could print the link on the back of the agenda, and you could get a link. Yeah, I could have brought it with you. It's about that thing. It's email me the link, and then I'll have her add it. Good, 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 good. Because I think what, what would be really nice about it is that um, people will then be able to download it. It's different articles. Okay, so it's like a list of resources. Yes, it is. Yes, so just give me the link, and what I can do is, if you, if it's something that I can just put on one sheet, or if she, I'm going to text her now and see if she's okay. printed it, and then um, I don't think she's link. printed it. Okay. And if not, I can print it through LCD. Okay. And what I'll do is I'm going to send you the link, and then you can send it out to the black electric, so they'll have it. Yeah, and I take it to your newsletter, and I'm going to send it out. Okay. I uh, okay. was supposed to do a shout-out thing again. Okay. Okay. I know. I got it. Start writing us up. I know. You don't want to tell me I'm just, we're all over the place. <laughs> but uh, I want to start doing, and, and I, I'm going to start getting resources together for the black like, like okay, yes. okay. so that people will have information okay. uh, that they can just kind of put on their computer. So I'll start getting that together. I'll make a list of things that they need to have. Okay, yes. Okay? All right. Okay, so we just going to move this around here. Good. Yeah. I just noticed that. I there you are. <laughs> but, um, I'll make sure that Lisa or one of us always get back to you. I okay. thought I thought we had taken care of that for you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I appreciate you. No problem. I'm happy to do it. At any time, uh, if you need to, Lisa will help run everything okay. down. So anything you need mm -hmm. uh, between me and Lisa, if I get to running all over the place, she'll back up for it. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate I'll, I'll make sure to become good, good friends with them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you need to come over and, uh, to our office so you can meet everybody and know what's going on with our office. And then any resources or okay. any support you need, you just, then you can let us all know. So you feel free to do that. I mean that. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Just call Lisa and set up with them. We can all sit down and talk and you know where we are. And well, you guys, you know, for my... The other part of my job is doing the economic development for the That's city. it. That's you know, it. Things that never may come up. So, yeah, well, you're welcome to any time. I mean that. And just let me know or let her know. And we'll set something up and get you squared away. Sounds good. <laughs> so, Jeff, how much, um, like, I know you're in economic development. Mm -hmm. You do... I work in the city's economic development, urban development department. Uh -huh, so you do we do. Um, we, it's where the economic development is, as well as the redevelopment. Okay. And then um, we used to be neighborhood services as well. Yeah, yeah. They're all the CD right. and home programs okay. and stuff like that. But they actually just moved that division out of our department. Okay. But um, yeah, we essentially do all the business, outreach, retention, expansion. We run the programs through the city for like um, a visual improvement program. And you come in and open a business, you get money to upgrade the exterior building. And we have another program called the uh, Quick Start Program where you can get money to do internal improvements and stuff like that. And we also have uh, that work with us. Um, people that help people walk through the permitting process mm -hmm. and stuff like that and then open a business to come in with go to the building with you and say, hey, these are the sorts of improvements you have to make so you have an idea before you come into the building or something. So that's essentially what we do during the day. So for the urban chamber, you know how they have the small business development center yeah. there? Is that grant funded through the city of Las Vegas or is that state funded? Okay. Since I, it's small business development center. I don't know the history. Here's what I know, so don't quote me on this. Is I understand that there was an EDA grant at one point that sort of got that thing up and running. Okay. And then the city has partnered with them in some way, shape, or form. There's a guy on our staff, Darren Harris, who works real closely with uh, the Urban Chain guys. Okay. And then um, I think the city provides some funding, the funding that then the Urban Chamber runs the day to day. Okay. So I'm not sure where the, we provide it what percentage or whatever the case is, but there's some city funding, as I understand it, that goes into it, okay. and then the other people participate, they maybe didn't put the grants again. Okay. 
Yeah. You know, right. I hooked up with Darren and he could tell you all about yeah. it from the city. That would be good. Yeah. I didn't want to know. All right, you know what? I'll make a note and um, she should get introduce you via email or phone call or something like yeah. that. Yeah, that's the Deutsche Foundation. We have a call from Nick, sir. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, we, we have a big event coming up March. So, yeah, just send an email. I will. I don't think. No, I was saying this, oh. yeah, oh. sorry. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> um, I don't know if I would. This week is going to be crazy. But, yeah, so I can email him. Yeah. And what I want to know. And then I think, you know, for the most part, and you can get there and those people over the, I'm sure you know, mm-hmm. summer. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. It's because we, if we think this is going to be part of the And then the summer. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Oh, no, if it's going to be part of the conversation. It's there and it's over all the time. I know that. That's no. part of the conversation. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but so all those other people over there, Star and Nevada. Yeah. You know, no, it's a personal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I was thinking, like, you know, small too. business development is yep. state funded, so. Right. But yeah, I can tell you. I'll do that. I'll make sure. I've got a note here to do that. Oh, yeah. I know I met your sister. I heard that. I thought that was true. She was so sweet. I was afraid that I'd get rid of her. Hello? Hello, this is Nancy Broom. Hi, Nancy, this is Jeff McGeechee. We're just getting ready to get started here in a couple minutes. You just want to hang on the line for a bit? Yes, I want to hang on. I'll be on the mute for most of it. Okay, yeah, you're, you're, yep, you're coming through the uh, speakers in the room right now, just to let you know. Yes, I knew that. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Chandra. This is Jeff Medici. We're uh, just getting ready to get started here in a few minutes. You want to hold on the line here? Sure, absolutely. I'm on my way. Okay. Yep, you're on the speaker. Thank you.
Oh, oh, Jenna? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jeff? Excuse me. Um, do you have, uh, I, I know I have, there's information online, do you have a website that you go to to get all this information? You mean, um, like a, a course in that specific? Yeah, that's it. Okay, other than what you have online, and what you think is like email. Okay. Yes, we didn't until actually we got to the uh -huh. uh -huh. for the first time. So uh -huh. we're going to be providing all the kind of sorts of tools moving forward. So this meeting tonight, the agenda and the meeting summary from the last meeting are on the city's website now. And then any handouts and anything that's going to come up. Hello, hello, hello. So this is not a consistent safety chart, I see. <laughs> it, is, it should be now. Oh, it's okay. We've retooled, and uh, okay. I think we're good with it now. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, where am I going? Um, but starting after this meeting, um, all the backup and everything that we're receiving now will be going on the city's website as backup, just like at a regular council meeting or something That's, like that. that's great. That's great. Okay, so... So, uh, so electronically, I'll just go to your for what you sent out as email. Yep. And uh, the minutes. But you have the minutes also clear. Do you have hard copy of the minutes? Yep, I got a hard copy of the summary minutes. Hello? 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 Hi. Councilwoman Brown. Brown. Okay, Councilwoman, thank you. Uh, this is Jeff McGeechee. We're just about ready to get started. You're on the speaker, and we'll be starting shortly. Thank you. 
Southern Nevada Enterprise Community Meeting to order. Um, the clerk, could you, are we in compliance with the open meeting law? Thank you. Yes, we are. And I will do the roll call if it's okay with you, Chair. Chair Neal? Here. Vice Chair Barlow? Excused. Member Young? Here. Member Atkinson? Present. Member Weekly? Excused. Member Goins Brown? Present. Member Summers Armstrong? Present. Member Hambrick? Present. Member Broom? Present. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to open up for any kind of public comment. Public comment on the agenda is set up for you to discuss any items that are actually on the agenda, and public comment that is set up at the end of the meeting is open for any comment. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come up on public comment on any of the agenda items listed? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on. So we need to welcome our new uh, board member, Dr. Nancy Broom. She was voted in last um, meeting, and she is now a member. She's from the Latin Chamber of Commerce, and she's now a member of the Southern Nevada Enterprise Community Board. Uh, Dr. Broom, do you have any comments for the board? No, I just wanted to say I'm to be part of the board. I look forward to working with everybody, so thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right, so we will move to item number five for possible action to approve the final minutes from the last meeting on September 16th. All right, we have a first from Dr. Young, second from Senator Atkinson, 
So we approved the minutes from the last uh, meeting, September 16th. So agenda item number six, the report from Mr. Medici about the summary budget status of SNCC. Jeff McGeechee, City of Las Vegas. The balance in the account is $1,271. There are no outstanding checks or um, invoices against the account at this time. Okay. So we move to item agenda item number seven, discussion for possible action regarding Urban Chamber of Commerce Economic Development Projects. We want to call the new president of the Urban Chamber, uh, Mr. Ken Evans, the Lieutenant Colonel, retired Lieutenant Colonel Ken Evans. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, uh, other members of the uh, SNEC Board. Uh, thank you very much for having me here this evening. Uh, what I wanted to do is, first of all, say thank you very much for this opportunity for me to come before you and share some information about the direction that the Urban Chamber is going in and more importantly things that we can do moving forward to support each other and for the Urban Chamber to be a source, of, a resource for individuals within your constituency. Uh, first of all, what I wanted to mention is that we have two, uh, I'm going to call them prime jewels that I want to make sure that everyone is aware of with the Urban Chamber. First of all, the business incubator, and my understanding is that Councilman Barlow has been uh, instrumental in making sure that the Urban Chamber partnership, as well as as we move forward, ownership of that particular facility is in place. So, uh, very glad to take stewardship of that stewardship of that particular facility and move forward. Make sure that two things happen: first of all, that we fill the facility. And second of all, that we have developed a waiting list for the facility so that it's uh, having max use utilization. Next, next, we also have a business success center, and this is a, another prime jewel in terms of resources because what we've managed to do, and it was put into place about a year ago, is combine and create a consortium of entities like the UNLV Center for Economic Development and Entrepreneurism, also SCORE, uh, in addition to that, the Micro Enterprise Institute, which offers uh, micro lending and other sources of lending for entrepreneurs and business owners. But we have several entities like that who work together in a collaborative manner to provide one-stop shopping or a one-stop resource for business owners and entrepreneurs. So moving forward, we want to make sure that the SNCC board is aware of those two resources that exist within your uh, community of responsibility, and we want to be an avenue to help business owners and entrepreneurs within your constituency. So to that end, what I want to propose is that moving forward, uh, for your consideration, if you have business owners or entrepreneurs, whether they be already in business or just starting or just interested, if you can identify those individuals to us, uh, our commitment will be that we will track those individuals much as we would any other uh, participant with the Business Success Center. But in light of the fact that there's a desire to have an economic development project via the SNEC board, we will identify those individuals, track their progress, and make sure that we're providing the resources necessary, again, through the incubator or through the Business Success Center to help them out. Just to give you an example of some of the things that we can do, we have a 15-week next-level program where we have actual business owners come in and they act as mentors, they can talk through the challenges that they're having and give them real-world examples of things that they can do or can consider uh, to help them with their business pursuits. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we can schedule those next-level classes as required. So, for example, if you had enough participants just from SNEC alone, we could create a next level class just for those particular participants, but we want to be as uh, customer centric and focused as we can be. Uh, the other thing that we, the Urban Chamber did in partnership with the Nevada Department of Transportation is, and I see my colleagues here in the audience, is we uh, hosted a seminar that was related to bonding. We, we do have quite a few members that are in the construction industry, so 
bonding is sometimes an issue, so we hosted a seminar and made that available to help them improve their capacity and capabilities as a company. So we have the ability and the willingness to do things like that as well. So moving forward, I just want to assure you that the Urban Chamber will continue to be a resource for SNCC participants as well as other participants, and that if there's anything uh, that we can do or ideas that you think of that we can do to help business owners and entrepreneurs, by all means, please make me aware of it. And at this time, I stand ready to answer any questions you may have, Madam Chair, or other members of the board. Okay, <laughs> members, Dr. Yell. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, you've been around for a minute or two, and you've just been so community oriented and so willing to give of your time and talent uh, to our community and to many members in our community. So thank you very much for that. I just have a couple, a couple questions and then a comment. Okay. Uh, one of my um, questions, the business incubator, where is that located and how do people get an opportunity to participate or contact someone? I, I, and I like the, the, the title of that. <laughs> right. The uh, business incubator is located at 1951, for the record, it's located at 1951 Stella Lake Street. Las Vegas, Nevada, 89106. Uh, physically, it is just west of the McDonald's that is located at the intersection of Martin Luther King and Lake Mead, uh, or if you will, across from the FBI building within the uh, Enterprise Park, the city of Las Vegas Enterprise Park. Uh, in terms of uh, participants or individuals that are interested, uh, they can contact our office at 702-648-6222, or they're also welcome during business hours, which are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., to come by the office, and someone would be glad to give them a tour, plus discuss the terms and conditions for possibly occupying space within the incubator. Oh, thank you. And um, my a second question, on your business success center, you said you have a, a kind of a consortium with UNLV and SCORE? That is, is that correct. Right? Is that Those correct? That is correct. Those are just two of the participants within the uh, business success center. It's probably along the lines of uh, eight to ten entities. And what I can do is I'll make a note and I'll make sure that I provide the specific participants' information back to the clerk for the board. I, that's something I can do. Okay. And my um, other comment is, this is great in terms of your business incubator and your business success center. Of course, you know, in education, I'm, I'm always in, <clears throat> involved with students, and I've got some always budding <laughs> entrepreneurs, and you know much of the future business leaders really start, sometimes in middle school and even high school. I was just looking at um, uh, 60 Minutes yesterday of this 15-year-old young man who now has a whole um, science entity that he's working with major corporations, 15 years old. And, um, and so uh, I, I'm, my comment is perhaps twofold. One, is there a youth component that, I know you're just getting started, but I'm just trying to put a little drop here, <laughs> to start uh, maybe working with uh, our school district and helping some of our little budding business people, yeah. even in middle school, high school, even elementary, quite frankly. Actually, uh, ma'am, your timing is uh, impeccable. And uh, First of all, uh, going to be a two-pronged approach as we uh, move forward. Uh, first of all, what we plan to do is identify the next set of entrepreneurs and business owners, if you will, and that's going to be two-pronged. First of all, uh, by coming up with some arbitrary categories, admittedly, but they break down so we can manage them to t age 25 to 40, and that kind of follows the uh, young professional model that we've seen with some other organizations, and then 18 to 25, which is probably college student or you know post-secondary uh, individuals that are interested. So that's part of the piece of the puzzle in terms of working with uh, budding entrepreneurs and business owners. But in terms of uh, 17 and below, I just had a conversation this afternoon with uh, Beverly Mason, and what I pr impressed upon her is that 
it is on our radar screen that we need to have some type of youth entrepreneurism component. Uh, we don't have to be in it by ourselves, but we don't mind taking the lead or at least helping to be a key impetus for it. But what that would amount to is possibly breaking it into high school age, meaning 13 to 17, and then uh, 12 and younger, but again, doing something where, if nothing else, we just introduce them to uh, entrepreneurism and business ownership. Uh, very quickly, if I may, Madam Chair, a uh, quick story. The way I got my start as a business owner and entrepreneur is taking the backs of uh, the plain postcards that don't have any design on them. I would draw birds and things like that on them, and then my mother and my grandmother, you know, you find these things out later on, but my mother and grandmother would purchase them, plus get the neighbors to purchase them. That was my entrepreneur, my introduction to entrepreneurism in the second and third grade. And it's something that I didn't go directly into, but things like that, lessons like that, exposure like that, stick with you. So our hope is moving forward, the Urban Chamber can do things like that on a wider scale. So it is on our mind, and I'm glad that you bring it up. Well, thank you. And then any support you need with that, I've got 60 schools, and probably we've got six high schools, and, and a lot of elementary schools. So I'm happy to uh, help with that in terms of the school district partnership, but also working with principals who would love to have an opportunity for some of their young people to be involved from the elementary, middle, and high. So. Uh, you know, consider me as a resource as well. Definitely will, uh, ma'am. Definitely appreciate that, and we'll make a note accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions from members? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Hamber? Barbie Hamber, you have asked a question for your address and location and hours you have given, but I need to know how, how large are your staff? Uh, right now, currently, our staff, it's a staff of three. Uh, we have an office manager, uh, Summer Rab, and then an administrative assistant, Delisa Stewart, and then I've been on board for not quite a month yet as the incoming uh, full-time uh, paid president for the organization, and my focus and charge is to provide some leadership and senior executive direction for the uh, organization. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for coming and presenting to the board. Um, it's listed for possible action in order to determine if we want to um, build a collaborative relationship with the Urban Chamber in regards to they want us to identify businesses that we can send to them and they'll be identified as SNCC businesses that they promote and develop and it'll be, um, I guess, developed into a structure where we have follow the process of who we selected that were innovative companies that we wanted to grow within this SNCC environment. So if that's an option for the board, um, you guys can, you know, have, we can have discussion on that. Yes, and Madam Chair, if I may, uh, one thing that we're sensitive to is the fact that as this is a project and I've attended some previous SNCC meetings prior to taking this position, I'm sensitive to the fact that we need to do this in a manner where we can track results, track progress, and then report back not only to the board, but in turn put you in a position so that you can report to the legislature. So I just want to assure you, as well as all the board members, that we're sensitive to that as well. So I'll make a motion in order to um, start a collaboration with the Urban Chamber to identify businesses within the SNCC community to be uh, get start be get, getting mentored through the Urban Chamber of Commerce, um, the motion to accept that relationship first, a second from, first from Dr. Young, second from Senator Atkinson. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Sorry, this is Nancy Brun. Uh, would that state through a collaborative relationship be available for an option for the other chambers that might have been in the SNCC area? Yes. Okay. Super, thank you. Ms. Armstrong? Madam Chair, my question would be how would we solicit these participants? <laughs> Um, I know we've had several business owners who've come in who actually
actually been present in our meetings who have wanted additional help and mentoring. And so we could pick from the existing, uh, mem not members, but uh, public who have come in and been present to start off. And then also we can identify from our own communities um, members or businesses that we would like to have a better relationship with urban now that they actually have leadership. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure that whatever process we do is even-handed. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Young? Um, and I would concur with um, Ms. Armstrong, Summers Armstrong, but I would also like to propose um, that we consider a request for proposal. In other words, we could do a um, just um, a, 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 a sort of a proposal asking people to submit what it is that they have using the, the information, a variety of information, but also putting something on maybe um, like through the through my my um, school district, um, also through churches, um, so that we could get a, a, a um, maybe a variety of different people that we might not know who might be interested. And a request for proposal would be just a simple little statement of what it is that what is your business, what it is that you need support for. What, where would this um, project go in the next couple, two or three years? You can do a simple, I mean, it doesn't have to be very elaborate, but, but it would be a process that some of us could um, um, submit through churches, through our various fraternities and sorority organizations and groups in the SNCC area, and you know what I'm saying, in the SNCC area. That, that would be my, my recommendation in the event that it, it wouldn't be totally contingent upon um, totally on us, but certainly we would have a strong part to play in it, but the information could get out some kind of way. That would be my um, Dr. Young, so the RFP kind of t takes us away from the initial discussion, which is the collaboration, to just agree to have the collaboration, right. which is the first motion, and then the second is, would be a, that would be a second issue that the board would have to talk about having an RFP process. Um, I'm not really sure that's needed because it's an urban chamber that is supposed to be soliciting and dealing with businesses already. We're just widening their scope and acting as a vehicle in order to say that we're now in collaboration and we will use our legislative capacity to as an influencer with the new urban chamber leadership. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, so we've got two motions to consider. One, I thought. Did we vote on the first one? No. Oh, okay. so we, so we need to vote, vote on the yeah. first one, which is yeah, that we want a collaboration. Yeah, let's um, do that. I agree. Okay. So, Madam Chairman? Yes? Can I ask a question first? Uh-huh. If we were to take the RFP round and it seemed like you were having Excuse to continue, and that's not the goal, we want people to come and not have to say, okay, we'll help you, and we won't, we won't help you if we go that route. Yeah. You, oh, this is uh, Councilwoman Goins, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got confused. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I was like, do we have an extra person? But um, you're, I would agree, but it's something that was brought up by a member, so we need to deal with the first motion, which is to accept the collaboration, then we can have discussion on this RFP, and either we can decide to say that's not a good move, we don't need that, and then we can move forward. But let's deal with the first motion, which is do we want a collaboration between SNCC and Urban Chamber? And that's what we need to take a motion on. Do we have more discussion revolving that particular motion? Okay, seeing none, so I'll open it up for a motion on that collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. And who was the maker of that motion? Me. Okay. Carolyn. Force. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Young. You're talking about who made the motion. Yes. Who made the motion? Okay. So Dr. Young. Okay. Our, yes. Okay. So we're gonna take a vote. All the members on the phone. Um, who are in favor of a collaboration between Southern Nevada Enterprise Community Board and Urban Chamber. Y'all all say aye. 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 Any, aye. Any nays? Aye. Okay, seeing no nays, we're moving forward. 
Now we have another motion on the table, which is to decide if an RFP process would be necessary. No, excuse me. Kim? Uh, it wasn't really a motion. Okay. It was just a discussion. Well, so I'm not. Just, okay, so we'll, we'll kill that because it would seem to be a part of the issue. So, all right, so there's no discussion on that. It's not a motion. No, it wasn't a motion. It okay. was just a suggestion. <laughs> so that suggestion is, is just a suggestion. We're not going to take a motion on that. Okay, all right, Mr. Young. I mean, not Young. <laughs> Mr. Edwards. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, Madam, Madam Chair and uh, members of the board, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to this uh, partnership and collaboration. And what I might suggest in uh, deference to the concerns that it be open and if it will help, perhaps what we can do is just prepare a one-page, half-page summary when you apply, basically a notice that you can send out to your constituency, they can respond to it, and then we can, or you can take it from there and channel the results to us if that's acceptable. Yes, that would that would work. And also, um, since the there's supposed to be some kind of uniqueness, right, with the SNCC relationship. So you guys already identify. Identify the services that you actually offer in that half page mm -hmm. so it can be very clear because I think what's happened within the leadership absence, um, urban chamber not being, everyone not being fully aware of number one, the next level, which I know uh, Jerry Merritt created. And so we need to actually be remarketing and re um, energizing the urban chamber. Understood. And we will do that, Madam Chair. All right, so we're going to close that agenda item, and we will move to agenda item number eight. Excuse me, Chair. Before we move on, on approval of the minutes, all I got was a first and a second. I don't think I got a vote, so could we please vote to make sure? All right, so let's go back to agenda item number five. We need to take a vote on approval of the minutes from September 16th. All the members in favor that this minutes are accurate? Can I get an aye? Aye. Aye. Are there aye. any nays? Seeing none, we have approved the minutes from September 16th. Thank you. Okay. So agenda item number eight. What you guys have in front of you is it's it's a little chart that says SNCC board project ideas. Even though it says Neil, I didn't have come up with all of those. I read the note cards from the audience members that came that first meeting. Um, it's back on the table to determine what is going to be our a project going forward. Reentry is no longer a project um, that we initially agreed on because there's no ability to actually de delegate under that reentry. Um, and so we need to come up with another project. The idea is that since 07, SNCC's been in the legislature as a committee, and we haven't been successful in terms of bringing a policy agenda forward or a policy issue that represents the SNCC area. And this is an opportunity to show for the 2015 legislative session that we actually have a policy agenda that involves that area. And so we need to either consider what's on this list, which came from community who was present on the August 12th meeting, or come up with something else that we think we can produce an actual legislative piece or a county um, policy or a city policy associated with SNCC. So we have roughly 15 months to try to produce something. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I just have a question about the um, proposed list that I apologize I wasn't here for the August 12th meeting. It's like a dime. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I mean, what we have on the list is just um, pretty much a sentence or a word. Does it, do we have anything in description, I mean, like, uh, like what any of these are doing? All we got were, we handed out note cards to the audience. They were public who wrote these things down. So there wasn't any um, deeper 
discussion. discussion. Right. It was a matter of filtering out what we thought was realistic and what we thought we could actually complete. The criminality of students was is already on our agenda. Um, there was a last the last meeting uh, we gave a report or at least one sheet of what CCSD is doing and their current recommendations and how we can either further the 10 recommendations that they currently have just for that area and figure how we can either further develop and promote that. So that will be a collaboration because uh, they already have a task force. I believe Dr. Young, she's on CEOPS. So, um, but we ha they actually have a set of recommendations that they need to move forward. Okay. And the reason I ask the question too is because it has source next to it and it has these names. So, and it uh, came from the board members and if they themselves had something they wanted to do. And I was just asking because I didn't want to step on any toes. Um, but certainly I know um, how the legislative process works a little bit. And um, if there was going to be an opportunity, like you said, uh, to something to come from here or would individual members be able to take one or two of these on, like myself and you who are in the legislature, and request our own bill drafts on some of these uh, if we can. I because mean, obviously I don't think that this um, uh, board has any bill drafts, um, and so then it would have to come from us. So, mm -hmm. just that's exactly right. Um, the source, uh, except for Chandra Armstrong, she a lot of these came from her specifically. I know the criminality of students, but there were note cards that were just read from the members, and so it was just because they didn't necessarily have names on the note cards, those names got associated with the different members on the board who actually read it. Okay. So, because I didn't have all those okay. as a list. <laughs> and I was going to say you were busy, but... No, <laughs> I'm not that busy. <laughs> so, we need to have a discussion about this list. Either we want to deal with something on this list, we want to take it off. I know... Um, we just need to, I think we need to have a policy win associated with SNCC. And I only say this because when I tried to amend the legislation, this last session in taxation committee, I was asked the question, what has the board done? And most interim legislative committees at least have a chance to push some kind of policy agenda that they're saying they focused on. Um, we in particular haven't. Um, we have the F Street, so I'm not going to not say that F Street came into this board and was also produced legislation associated with it. So that is one thing. But beyond that, we needed we actually need something else to show that this uh, interim committee is relevant and that we're going to continue it as a legislative appointed committee because we really are a legislative appointed committee through the commission. So, so any discussion from the members? Uh, I don't necessarily have further discussion. I would assume this isn't today, but this is something that we're going to continue to kind of look at. Mm -hmm. um, I just would like to see some of these, if we are going to consider um, taking any of them on, that um, they be explained for like what the intent of it. I mean, like reentry. I mean, obviously it's a simple one, but it may not be because whoever did it may be thinking something entirely different. I figured that. I wasn't going to call no, it out. Um, <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to see if there was going to be any teeth or are we going to add the teeth. And if we are, then that's fine. I just wanted to know that going forward. We are actually the teeth adders. Dr. Young, I think, or Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> All right. I just, I just wanted to um, mention that if we look at the list, um, the, criminal, the criminality of students or some type of criminalization of student behavior and suspension information is listed three times. Three different sources. If you did not put that in there, uh, Chairwoman Neal, a public member did at the top. It was one of the comments that I received when I reached out to the community and then it looks again like it was mentioned um, by um, Councilwoman Goins Brown. And so I think that that, by it being there three times, we, we have a situation that people are taking note of. I know that it's being discussed by the school district, um, and I know that there has been some type of um, a committee placed together to, to study this issue. Um, but I think I'd also like to know, aside from just collecting data uh, district-wide, 
it would be extremely interesting to see how this is affecting the children in the SNEC zone. What are our percentages compared to the rest of the district, our children? How many days of school are they missing? The types of offenses that are being um, used as, um, as reasons for kids to be expelled, how that compares with outside of our um, area, and um, the racial and um, gen gender makeup of that would be very interesting as it pertains just to us and then compare that overall. And I think that's just really drilling down into the data that they're already, co already collecting. And I think because we have several schools in our community that are, um, we have prime six, we have some that are struggling, um, we have, you know, right. yeah, we, we need to know what those, what those issues are um, for our community. Dr. Yan? Um, I was going to kind of just add to that as well. Um, we are doing some things, but we are we're really looking at a way where, um, and, and a, a, we, we can take the SNCC map area or the area that's, that is, that have schools in the SNCC area, mm -hmm. and then we can take the schools that are in other areas and do a cross-reference on that. What the district is doing, and I do have those 10 to 11, 12 recommendations that I will be presenting um, this Thursday, quite frankly. <laughs> As, yeah, this Thursday for our, uh, our, our black elected official PowerPoint. That, remember I was telling you was gonna do that. Um, so we are in a, um, what I call consistent and continuous process to see what we need to do about that. And it's not just talk anymore. We've got to really get to some real action. And so the data we can provide for the SNCC board. Um, so I'll work with uh, Jeff, maybe. And then you can, remember I told you I was going to have you come over to the school district? Now, yeah, see, now yeah, you're, you're part of that. And so that could be something that we could uh, pull together now. It may take us a minute or two to get everything in the in the in the right um, right frame that we want. But I think it's really important. It's it's really critical. So I do see that as as really one that ought to be a project for us. And the district is ready. The school district is ready to collaborate um, with not only the SNCC board but with the community. And this would be something we could then outline some of the specifics we're really trying to do to answer that con the concern of what we call inequity and overrepresentation in terms of suspension and expulsion and students uh, being assigned to what we call behavioral and um, alternative educational programs. Okay. Is there any discussion? I have any from any members on the phone. I have one comment. So what I think what we can do outside of uh, signing Jeff, is there any member on the board who wants to, in terms of these, um, I guess working with Dr. Young to make sure that the overlay with maps that she, she's willing to create is exactly what's envisioned um, to show the offenses, zip codes, reason for expulsion, and really um, gives the racial gender makeup and comparison contrast and a prime six relationship. Because not all your schools not all the schools in SNCC are prime six, so it would be, so there might be two subsets, the prime six relationship and then the, the larger schools that are also in the SNCC but not prime six. So um, is there any member who wants to follow this issue and follow it through? There could be two people. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So I'd be happy to work on the issue. I actually wanted to ask a question of Dr. Young. I had heard that the new the superintendent has actually reorganized and has kind of six czars, if you will, and that uh, one of the, there's somebody who's appointed to work on the school discipline issues. And I was just wondering whether it makes sense to actually 
in addition to working on this project, either have someone on the set board sit on one of those, because I guess they're doing advisory committees, or each of ours is putting together a community advisory committee. And so I was wondering whether it makes sense to have someone from the set board sit on one of those advisory committees, or I guess Andre is in charge of the school disciplinary issues, or whether it, be, it makes sense to at least recruit someone from our community who would be interested in sitting on that committee. Okay. So I'm okay. Um, you know, anytime we can have um, people on advisory committees or any of our committees to hear the information or to be a part of the discussion or part of the development of the information, I think it's a good idea. So um, I'm going to be meeting with the superintendent tomorrow. I'll be happy to uh, present this as a um, recommendation. I mean, if, is this... Is this what the board is recommending? This was a suggestion. We actually already voted on the criminality of students. Now this would be our expansion into how detailed we're going to get into that issue. We voted on this. What, did we vote on that September 16th meeting? Or was it August 12th? Mr. McGeechee? I believe it was the August 12th. Okay, so we voted on that issue. We, now we're have, we have a direction. Okay, and so now what we need to do is assign, uh, you're already on this committee, but we can assign one additional members or two additional members to also follow and if they want to divide up, you know, this czar issue, um, also somebody has to make sure that the map says what we said it wants, we want it to say from this meeting. You know, because it's like there's two subsets, the prime six relationship, and then the, um, the broader uh, district relationship to Prime 6 and then a comparison contrast to Prime 6 and the other schools within that area. So I want to go ahead and um, if we're in agreement, let's, let's make a motion that we're in agreement that this is our direction that we want to go based on these eight factors. Do we want to, do I need to repeat the factors yes, again? Please. Okay, so the factors that were listed were to do a district-wide comparison with the SNCC-based uh, schools. The One of the factors was to deal with the offenses, the type of offenses. Number two, we were going to outline those zip codes. Three, the reasons for expulsion. Four, there would be a comparison contrast um, to the relationship to the prime six schools within that subset. We wanted to get a racial and gender makeup, right? And we wanted to make sure that the, whatever was presented had an overlay with the maps. So it has a, at the schools listed inside of the actual SNCC area. And that, um, that, that was the last thing. Because I think you said consistent and continuous. But you wanted to make sure that the continuity was that whatever, whatever the recommendations that were outlined are a continuous process applied to the SNCC schools. So that's what I wrote down. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's make let's take a motion on um, whether or not this is our approved direction and then let's take a vote. So I'll take a motion on our approved direction for criminality of students. I make a, um, I'll make a motion that this be our direction that these eight items will encompass our focus on this okay. issue. So that's the first from Chandra, second from Senator Atkinson. All right, so a vote from all members. It all in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Aye. Okay, seeing no nays, then this is the direction that we're moving forward for the CEOPS issue. Um, is there any other discussion related to this? The bo okay, I need to actually make a motion to assign two people to work with uh, Dr. Young. So my understanding, we have Dr. Broome and Ms. Chandra Armstrong. Yes, I will assist, but I will first admit that it will probably be limited. Okay. But I will kick in wherever I can. Okay. All right, so we have a motion to assign members Dr. Brune and Ms. Armstrong to work with Dr. Young on collecting this information. So I need a first. 
Okay. Yeah, I know. This is a, a first from Dr. Young <laughs> and a second from Senator Atkinson. All right, let's take a vote that these two members are all in favor. Aye. 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 Any nays? No. All right, moving on. So uh, what we can do for the next meeting, you guys go through this list. What I can do is provide the note cards. I believe I still have the note cards. I don't know how much value it will give you, but I do have the note cards that probably have a little bit more information. But we need to come up with one other project that is uh, realistic and that's doable. Um, and so we can talk about that in December because our next meeting is in December. So that's more than enough time to eat turkey and think deeply on project ideas. All right. So uh, we will now move to item number 10. We're going to take it out of order. So item number 10, it's the same presenter, Ms. Truman, is going to come up. So she's going to discuss item number 10 and then number 9. And then, and then we're almost finished. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Truman. Welcome and thank you for coming. Good evening, Yvonne Schumann, and Dr. Uh, Civil Rights Officer for the record. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the board, thank you for inviting me here today to uh, bring you up to date on what's happening with uh, Project NEON. Um, I don't have a lot of Project NEON information, which is why I wanted to do that first, and then we could spend a little bit more time on the disparity study. Um, some limited uh, Project NEON employment activity has been begun, but it's very limited at this point. Right now, we're still in the process of reviewing uh, statements of qualifications for the uh, concessionaire. And the concessionaire, of course, will be the party that's really involved in doing all of the hiring going forward. Um, there's no immediate employment hiring deadlines, One of the, and that's because this is a unique project. Uh, for the first time uh, in our history, we're going to have a very long-term project. 35, 38 years is the projection. So the idea is to make sure that we have um, employment opportunities and subcontracting opportunities throughout the entire uh, 35 to 38 year period. Uh, in the initial phase, which would be next year at the earliest, most of the employment opportunities are going to be for skilled technical work such as civil, structural, hydraulic, CAD, engineering and design phase. So uh, that's the kind of employment opportunities we see initially. But following that, there should be a long term of employment opportunities for um, operators, iron workers, carpenters, laborers um, during the construction phase. The construction phase is going to be about five years. And then the bulk of that 35, 38 year uh, contract is going to be the maintenance phase because whoever the concessionaire is will be responsible for operating that stretch of the highway and maintaining the condition of the, of the highway. So that's where uh, we'll see a lot of maintenance activities keeping the structure sound um, throughout that 35, 38 year period. So that's kind of all I have for the project. No. Yeah, are there any questions? That's good. Yeah, Senator Ack. Thank you. Um, thanks for the, um, for the information. So it's Project Neon will be about a 35 year project. Can you give us the um, from the from and where to again? Um, it looks like uh, we're going to have a short list of concessionaires by spring 2014, which means and then there'll be another five months following that before we actually select the concessionaire. So you know, we're, that puts us way deep into 2014 before right. we even have a concessionaire. And so we anticipate that the actual on-the-ground project activity won't start until early 2015. Okay. And then, uh, Chairman, if I could follow up just a second. <clears throat> One of the other things, so 
because I heard you say this, and I, cause it's one of the things I've been saying for the last few weeks, um, this whole skill technical workers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know that we tend to sometimes talk about jobs and jobs as they relate to, to our communities. Um, mm -hmm. And may not, well, because you're from the diversity division of the department, but what do we do, and it could be an offline discussion, and we certainly can sit down and talk about it, but what do we do to get these um, folks ready? I mean, because I know we always talk about these numbers and say how many people are out on projects, where are these jobs going, um, but then I have a different perspective on some of it because they are skilled jobs. I mean, they're not just, you know, and I like to say myself, I'm not at risk 99% of the time when I go to work. Um, I see Ms. Summers Armstrong um, works across the parking lot from me, and the only danger she's in going to and from work is probably getting hit by me in the parking lot. So, <laughs> I, uh, so, <laughs> so I know that our, that risk isn't there, but when you start talking about these skilled trade jobs, um, they are highly technical, but they're also dangerous. I um, read this morning San Francisco, um, the new ballpark that they're building, one of the construction workers got killed yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just don't know what we're doing, if we're doing enough uh, outreach to um, the folks that we are trying to advocate for. Um, are we doing enough to get them the skills and stuff that they need to take these jobs when they do become available, and I don't think that we are. I'm not saying that that's solely your job, it's certainly ours too, um, but pushing them in the right direction because sometimes we believe because the jobs are available, they're not getting them, but when you start talking about them being skilled and highly skilled jobs, well you can't, because I can tell you I can't do electrical work. I mean, if you want the place to burn down, I can take a stab at it, but, um, but they do become that way, and then they become, the more skilled they become, the more dangerous they become um, because those kind of uh, things exist. So I don't know if we have and if we can do enough and maybe you have some advice, um, but I'd like to, to start trying to get um, some of these folks when they just think that we can just, you know, well, the entry level job of an electrician, but it's still, you got to have some skill. And so we've got to figure out a way how to get them and push them, especially when we know these kind of things are coming, we're talking about 35 years, et cetera, et cetera. You know, maybe we think that the next line of jobs is going to be in Medicare, which I believe it's going to be in my daughter's 17, and I'm kind of pushing her in that direction, not that she's listening, but um, because I believe that's where they are going to be, but, you know, but these are two, and so we've just got to figure out how to um, make sure that they're getting these skills so that they, when we do put up these announcements and say these jobs are available, we have some folks ready to go. So I, I mean, I hope that makes sense. I know I was trying Sure, to sure. Um, I think um, I can't emphasize enough, again, Yvonne Schumann and Doc, for the record, um, how important it is uh, that people get their skills together now and not wait for a job announcement because it's too late then. Mm -hmm. So this sort of tells you what, what's coming up and people can start getting prepared. So that first group really are engineers, um, civil engineers, structural engineers, uh, you know, they're all uh, mostly uh, engineering uh, type jobs and, and involved in the design phase of the project. And we won't get to electricians and iron workers and carpenters and stuff until we get to the construction phase. However, uh, this, it's likely that those will be union jobs. So people need to get in the union. If they're not in the union now, they need to get, you know, get into the apprenticeship program if they're not already uh, holding journeyman status from some union somewhere else. And if they do have the experience to uh, obtain journeyman status now. They need to sign up, get in the union, and make sure that they are moving up the list so that they'll be um, the people who are called uh, when the um, the job uh, jobs become available. So now's the, the important time to get ready. Don't wait. So anything we can do to encourage people to get the skills and training they may need to take advantage of these opportunities. Now is the time. Madam Chair, to that end, if I might just interject here, a shameless plug. Uh, there is going to be 
Uh, the fourth annual Coalition of Black Trade Unionists will have a job and apprentice fair at the West Las Vegas Library Thursday, the 17th of October, from 2 to 5 p.m. And uh, I received this announcement, and I think that it's important. Uh, phone number is 507-3982 or 5307-3989. And I think that it's important what you're saying, your concern, um, uh, and also your re response is that we need to get started now. We also have in our SNEC area a wonderful school called Advanced Technology Academy. And ATEC trains young people to do CAD, and some of the kids there are in the engineering program. My son was years ago. And I never, ever can remember the four years that my oldest son went and the four years that my second son went, that there was any kind of outreach that came to the school. Maybe I missed it. It's highly probable where our unions and uh, or other trade organizations were going to speak to those young people and talk to them about opportunities to become members. Those young people are doing, my son was doing CAD, um, drawing things that moved in the ninth and 10th grade. Wow. These kids are way ahead and, and many of them are from our community and so we need to be reaching out um, at the school level as we are talking about with entrepreneurs, also with our kids. If we've got projects that are going to be going from this long, that's a career for someone mm -hmm. and, a, and a true opportunity. And so we need to think a little bit differently about how we're recruiting. It's not just for the adults, but we need to look at our young folks too because trust and believe they're going to need work. And if we intend to have any support for Social Security, Medicare, they need, they need to work, okay? So anyway, that's my shameless plug there, and um, hopefully we can get the word out. Any comments from any members on the phone? No, not for me. Okay. So the main reason why we had this discussion on uh, Project NEON is because um, as a board, we wanted to be proactive, and we wanted to figure out how we can, based on what Senator Atkinson and Ms. Armstrong said, number one, plan, number two, recruit, and ID people who are currently on the apprenticeship list already who may be moving up in seniority or maybe they went and got additional training, but definitely try to make them aware that there are opportunities, and especially for our engineers who may be a part of our community helping them to become aware that this is a potential opportunity because we have some college graduates who are structural engineers and civil engineers who came right out of UNLV and this may be an opportunity so just trying to be proactive so alright so we'll close that agenda item and we'll move to agenda item number nine thank you chairwoman um, so today I want to talk primarily about the disparity study and uh, why it was done. Excuse me, Chair, could you please read item number nine? Item number nine is the report by Yvonne Schumann, the Nevada Department of Transportation, regarding the disparity study being prepared by NDOT. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we do a disparity study uh, what the current dis disparity study results um, indicate and, and how we plan to proceed from there. So uh, essentially, um, as the result of several Ninth Circuit Court decisions, uh, state departments of transportation in the Ninth Circuit Western states all have to uh, prepare disparity studies or something similar to that to um, identify and determine whether or not there are disparities and discrimination in the marketplace that are impacting uh, the access of uh, disadvantaged businesses uh, to NDOT or other State Department uh, Transportation uh, contracts. 
And so that's the reason why we do this. Some people have suggested to us, oh, why does INDOT do these disparity studies? They cost a lot of money. We think it's a waste of time. We already know there's a problem. Well, we don't really have a choice. And, and, and in order to continue uh, administering the federal DBE program, which is the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, we have to conduct a disparity study every three to five years or somewhere in that range. So um, as the, this slide shows, um, these are the uh, purposes of uh, a disparity study. It provides information for NDOT to make decisions about future operation of the DBE program. Uh, it also gives us the data that we need to set our overall DBE goal. Every three years we have to set a program, a DBE program goal, and this uh, information helps us do that. Um, we also have to consider uh, whether or not NDOT can achieve our overall DBE goal solely through uh, neutral means such as our small business program and other uh, neutral activities. And uh, if NDOT needs to continue the DBE contract goals, uh, then we must determine the specific race, ethnic, gender groups that are eligible for that program component. Because the Ninth Circuit opinion said a couple of things. One is, as I stated earlier, you have to first demonstrate that there's a need for some sort of program like this. And once you um, make that determination, you then have to identify what specific groups are adversely impacted by the disparities and discrimination in the market. You can't just say the program is for minorities. You have to say, be able to demonstrate uh, the uh, disparities against each group to determine whether or not each group should be in the program. If a particular group isn't experiencing any disparities, then the uh, Ninth Circuit opinion suggests that we cannot have them in the DBE program. Secondly, uh, once you've determined that you do need uh, to have the DBE program, the Ninth Circuit opinions require us to narrowly tailor our remedies. So that means that we can't have programs that go beyond uh, what the problem is in terms of trying to uh, address those problems. Um, and so the last reason that we have um, uh, disparity studies is to get some outside uh, view of our practices and our policies. We're obviously not the uh, organization that conducts the study. We've hired a consultant to do that. So the information that is in the disparity report is uh, the consultant's perspective on the information that's collected, not in docs. And the next slide um, gives you an overview of the type of data that was collected. Um, so first of all, the data collection and the, and the study began in September 2012, so just over a year ago. And in the process, the consultant looked at more than 1,800 uh, NDOT and LPA uh, construction and engineering contracts between 2007 and two, and. Uh, 2012. Um, from that, uh, they contacted more than 3,900 Nevada businesses about the work they performed and whether they were qualified and interested in NDOT work. They analyzed the data in the Nevada marketplace. They conducted in-depth interviews with 40 individuals and collected comments from 228 other business owners and managers. They analyzed the bids and proposals in those 1,800 uh, contracts above. Um, and then they met with uh, an external uh, stakeholder group and, and federal highway representatives throughout the study. As I mentioned uh, earlier, part of the reason we do the uh, disparity study is to help us set our three-year uh, goal. Um, and so based on the data that we've collected uh, in the study, our base availability figure for disadvantaged businesses is 4.5%. And to put that number in uh, perspective, that's in contrast with our current DBE goal of 10.48% per year. Um, the, the rules that govern 
the DBE goal setting, which are in 49 CFR Part 26.45, also uh, allow us to do a step two adjustment looking at other factors that may uh, suggest an upward or downward movement in the base um, availability. And after looking at those factors, uh, we believe that there's support to increase the goal from 4.5% to 7.5%. That is the recommendation that we'll be making to our Transportation Board and to the Federal Highway Administration, which has to approve it uh, in the coming weeks. The um, uh, 49 uh, CFR Part 26 also requires that uh, the majority of the goal, uh, as much as you can, uh, should be met through neutral means. And to the extent that that's not possible, then you would need to set uh, project goals. Uh, so the study shows in our case that uh, over the study period between 2007 and, and 2012, uh, DBEs obtained 1% of contract dollars when there were no DBE contract goals. So when there's no DBE contract goals, that means we're using completely neutral means to administer the program. Um, another uh, important uh, point, don't really need to study uh, for that, um, is in the three years that NDOT had the 10.48% program goal, we have not met that number. Uh, the closest, well, last year we we uh, reached seven percent, and right now um, we're still um, analyzing the numbers. But it looks like we're going to be in the eight to nine percent range for closing out uh, 2013. So it looks like we will not meet the 10.48 percent goal once again. This um, chart. Uh, gives you an illustration of um, where the uh, contract dollars have gone to DBEs uh, over uh, the first uh, disparity study, which we did in 2007, and then the current one. So the bar on the left shows that 3.1% um, of uh, the in-doc contract dollars went to DBEs. That lighter color uh, above that number uh, is for MBEs and WBEs in the aggregate. Not MBEs, minority business enterprises, and WBEs, women business enterprises, aren't all DBEs. So the darker color is just the ones that are DBEs, and the lighter colors are the ones that are not um, uh, certified DBEs, and under the program, we can only count the participation of certified DBEs in meeting our program goal. Can I ask a question on that slide? Yes. So, the 2007 to 2012, the DBE looks like it shrunk? It did. Um, between uh, 2007 and most of 2010, there were no uh, DBE uh, goals because of the, the Ninth Circuit uh, opinion. All of the departments of transportation stopped placing uh, DBE goals on projects because we had not yet done um, the disparity study. In this case, we did it in 2007, but we still didn't begin um, doing uh, uh, project goals which are considered uh, race conscious goals until the very end of 2010, beginning of 2011. And, and that happened because Federal Highway directed that NDOT begin doing that. So um, basically, you didn't have, you have basically about a year's worth of uh, DBE goals being set in that second bar. Uh, and that's the reason why the number went down. Okay. Go ahead. Ms. Shirley, if you all are not meeting your goals, mm -hmm. why decrease the goal? Doesn't a higher goal, it implies to me that a higher goal would mean that you all would work harder at trying to get things done and meet your goals. 
And by reducing the goal almost in half, if we're looking at a base goal, uh, reducing from 10.48 down to 4.5, even if you meet your sales halfway in the middle at 7.5, you you're still dropping three points. And it just seems to me that you take the pressure off your staff, off your departments, off your contractors when you reduce the goal. Please, please explain. Yes, well, um, again, according to those Ninth Circuit opinions, you can only set goals and, and administer the program based on what the data shows. And if the data says that you only have 4.5% availability and, we, and we're bumping that up because we can demonstrate that there are additional barriers in the marketplace that are impacting the ability of DBEs to do work, then we can't set a goal that we don't have DBEs to perform. So according to the data, we only have a base of 4.5% and we're bumping that up to 7.5%. Um, and so if we were to set a goal at a level that, that is higher than the data supports, it puts the entire program uh, at risk of being uh, attacked and, you know, the DBE program is attacked every day. People are suing to get rid of the DBE program every day. And so to the extent that our program doesn't adhere to what the court required, the whole program becomes vulnerable. So we want to stay as close to what the court requires in order to maintain the program. The whole thing would become uh, at risk if we didn't do that otherwise. Ms. Schumann, do you know offhand for 49 CFR 26.45, you talked about the factors that basically the statute tells you to review for recommendations of either to raise or lower the goals and do it within neutral means, correct? So what are the factors that are currently in place or that if you can ID them or you can email them to us that are going on when you see that the second study shows that there is limited increase in growth within the two studies, the one that covered 99 to 06 and then from 07 to 2012, what you see is a decline in the Native American numbers uh, where they were higher in 07 than they completely dropped in 2013. How do you document whatever barrier it was that they faced the Hispanic-owned firms appear to have stayed at 60 in both segments. And then for the African-American, in the first segment of the study, there were five 90, in 99 to 06. And then there were six. So they grew by one in the span of the time that we spent on the studies. Um, what does CFR, 49 CFR, say we should do with that kind of data? What does it tell us to do? Well, it tells us to look at the reasons for um, the lower availability or participation of those groups. And that's what we've done. And we've looked at both um, marketplace factors and other factors that have impacted uh, DBE participation uh, in, in that um, uh, contract. So, for example, um, home ownership and home equity is an important foundation for most small, small business owners in getting started. Most of them use their equity in their home to start their businesses. To the extent that uh, minorities are discriminated against in home ownership, in, in home mortgage lending, both in terms of getting approved and in the rates and terms on those mortgages, that's going to have an impact on their ability to form and capitalize their businesses. So we looked at the data on that. And we also looked at the data on business credit, access to business credit, and the patterns were pretty much the same. Holding constant for all of the credit criteria Minorities are more likely to get denied for uh, business credit. Uh, the cost is usually an average of two percentage points higher than it is for uh, non-minorities. So you have that barrier. 
uh, that's creating uh, a problem. It's impacting why we have fewer um, uh, DBEs available. Then, then you have, um, with the NDOT itself, you have life uh, insurance requirements, you have bonding requirements. Those, again, tend to create additional barriers for uh, small and disadvantaged businesses to participate. And um, I think those are really sort of the key things. So when we looked at all of that information, that's how we determined that we need to increase the 4.5% to 7.5%. So that otherwise, if you were to stick with the 4.5, you would basically be perpetuating the discrimination that got us to the 4.5 in the first place. During that uh, 2007 uh, through uh, 2012 uh, study period, a lot of minority businesses went out of business because we didn't have goals and they weren't getting the work. So by not having goals, they got less work and many of them ended up going out of business. And so that pushed the, the availability down, uh, unfortunately. But we try to make up for that by increasing it 3% to create that additional pressure to do more than what the number tells us that we can do within reason. And this is my final question. Um, for 07 through 2012, how did the, uh, I guess the creators of the study deal with the recession? How was that factored and weighed in, being that there was more than one group that was affected but uh, clearly there would, there's going to be a greater disparity, right, for the group that is the underdog that wasn't achieving. But how did they do that comparison? How did they um, explain the absorption rate between that, those recessive years? The study did look at the recession in, uh, in Nevada. Obviously, the, it, it was more difficult here than it was almost anywhere in the country. And uh, the data that they... Uh, examined indicated that while it hurt everyone, it still had a disproportionate adverse impact on women and minorities and small businesses. And so they did look at that and, and make a finding that the economic downturn had a more significant impact on the disadvantaged groups. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you get back through your slides. I think we probably asked some of the things that were on the other slides. So <laughs> uh, we can probably just speed through the rest. <laughs> okay, we'll try to do that. So um, this slide um, talks about utilization. And um, you also have a, a chart uh, that was passed out. And basically, this is the information that is on that chart. I have the 2007 results in the 2013 uh, results uh, on here. And um, basically what it shows is for MBEs, minority business enterprises, um, they um, had a very uh, tough uh, time uh, during the study period. Um, and having um, uh, as you can see, African American, Asian Pacific American, subcontinent Asian American, and Native American combined had basically one tenth of one percent of all the contract dollars. So that's that's a problem. Um, and then uh, Hispanic Americans receive 2.2 percent of contract dollars. That turns out to be um, close to um, what their utilization was, and so that's um, uh, actually almost right on track. The, the outlier are, are the WBEs, which are the white women-owned firms. And if you look at the chart, um, you'll see that um, their utilization was 2.9%, but their availability was 1.2%, so that's like more than double utilization of them than what you would expect uh, based on their numbers as it relates to construction contracts on 
professional services contracts, which are engineering, design, consulting types of contracts, all of the groups fared poorly uh, during the study period, um, something around uh, three-tenths of the one percent of the contract dollars going to the DBEs. Madam Chair, if I may, what is the explanation from your consultant on why the WBE numbers, WDBE numbers were I think surprisingly overperforming? I don't think the study data provides an answer for that. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we're doing is we've engaged some researchers uh, at UNLV to look at just that group uh, specifically so that we can try to answer that question. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next slide um, lists some of the action items that we're considering to try to address the findings uh, in the study. Um, so one is um, encouraging more subcontracting activity by the prime contractors, possibly in dot setting uh, subcontracting minimums. Um, we also want to look at modifying um, our pre-qualification process uh, that limits the size of contracts a firm can bid. Um, Nevada seems to be unique uh, in the United States in that the contractor's board, when it issues a, a contractor's license, it also sets a monetary limit uh, on that license, and then uh, the holder of that license can't take on any work, individual projects that exceed that uh, limit. And as far as we can tell, and our consultant has done uh, over 70 of these studies, he has never seen another state that has a similar limitation exercised by the uh, contractor's board. So that creates a, uh, a barrier all in itself because um, you've got them limiting the size of the job and that limit is low as it often is for disadvantaged business enterprises. It makes it hard for them to get work with NDOT when our jobs tend to be quite large in size, both uh, scope and dollars. Um, in addition to the limitations set by the contractors board, NDOT has its own set of pre-qualification requirements. So when you lay, layer NDOT's requirements over the contractors board uh, limitations, you've got limitations on top of limitations that are interfering with the ability of these uh, firms to get work and so that's something um, that we want to look at and with respect to the contractors board that would require legislative action to bring them sort of in line with the rest of the country. Um, we're also uh, going to be taking another look at the, the recently enacted local preference bid law, uh, at not this session, but the prior session, to ensure that newer and smaller Nevada businesses uh, can benefit from it because of the requirements of the local preference law uh, a dollar amount in tax revenue that must have been paid in number of, uh, of employees with uh, Nevada licenses and so forth, that can work against a small business. They may not have paid that level of taxes because their revenue is so low and so they, don't, uh, they often are not able to take advantage of the local preference um, uh, in the NRS. And um, the consultant is suggesting that NDOT consider set-asides and bid preferences uh, to encourage the use of small businesses for small construction contracts. We do have uh, a small dollar uh, construction program for projects at $250,000 or less, but it's not limited to small businesses or disadvantaged businesses. Any contractor can bid for that work. Uh, what's unique about that program is just that it's a, a less formal process. There's no public uh, announcement of the project. Uh, the uh, NDOT 
uh, the district that is uh, letting out the work will actually just contact uh, contractors that are on their list to let them know we need a quote. And so we need to do a lot more to make sure that small businesses and, and DBEs know about those opportunities, but it's not enough for them to simply know about those opportunities. They can't really compete against the mega contractors on price, so they could still end up not getting the work even if they're in the program. So we need to look at how we can uh, use that program more just for small businesses and, and disadvantaged businesses. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at uh, ways we can remove barriers to small businesses and DBEs. As uh, Ken Evans mentioned earlier, we partnered with the Chamber earlier this year to provide a bonding education program. Um, for the uh, firms that participated, we've had two that are getting bonding as a result of that workshop. And we're going to conduct uh, the same workshop in 2014 in uh, northern Nevada. And we'll probably do it again, I just can't say when, um, in, uh, in Las Vegas. But we didn't have as much uh, participation from the DBE community as one would hope. And, and so that's kind of uh, disappointing that not enough of them took advantage of that free uh, series of workshops. Um, we're also going to be looking at uh, monitoring and addressing any over-concentration issues. What that means is those are uh, industries or trades where um, DBEs are getting the work almost to the exclusion of all non-DBE firms. And where we see that happening uh, is in the trucking area. On federal projects, uh, for about 40% or more of all of the trucking dollars go to DBEs. And that might explain some of the overutilization of WBEs because many of those trucking firms are owned by WBEs. So there's probably some correlation between the two, but that won't explain it 100%. I'm sure there's some other issues there. We're also going to uh, be looking at our staffing issues. My staff has been um, understaffed significantly the entire uh, time that I've been at NDOT, and we're still in the process of trying to get uh, positions uh, approved and, and so that I can hire people to do the work that needs to happen. So um, at our uh, public meetings, which are coming up uh, really soon, October 22nd in Reno and October 24th in Las Vegas at the RTC building, I will have uh, the DBE goal memo that will go into a lot more detail about what we looked at to come up t uh, with that 7.5% uh, number. And so I encourage people to attend so they can not only uh, receive that information, but uh, provide some feedback on, on that information. Tell us you know, what you want to see different uh, from what we've done. That's, uh, we're taking public comments on the uh, disparity study and um, the proposed DBE goal through November 8th. And I've had a special uh, email account set up to receive that since we released the draft September 9th and I haven't received a single public comment. So please encourage people who, who are interested and concerned about either of those things to, to, to provide their comments, their feedback. Ms. Schumann, believe it or not, I sent it out and what's funny is that they send the comments back to me. So I don't know how legal that is. And like, I could send you like 15 other people's comments that are not mine, but yeah, I've been, I've been trying to encourage them to get on the website yourself and actually submit your comments. Yeah. But literally, they just send me back what they want to say. Okay. Well, we'll take everything that we can get, but it is better if they submit it directly uh, themselves. Um, 
uh, so that we can uh, make sure that uh, we haven't made any um, errors in our conclusions and assumptions uh, in the report. It is a very hefty uh, report. Um, this is it double-sided. So um, I would say pick and choose the things that are of most interest to you. And I, again, the chapter seven is the chapter that uh, is the actual disparity analysis discussion that tells you the information that's on uh, this table. And that's sort of the most important information there. But there's some other uh, parts of it that are very interesting and useful. Uh, there's an appendix, and I, I don't remember which one, if it's I or J, but that includes some excerpts of the remarks from the interviews that were conducted. And they had people who were interviewed who were both, well, they included prime contractors, small businesses, DBEs. Um, I think that's sort of the universe. And it really, what was striking for me about the comments is that it didn't matter who they were, none of them really understood the DBE program, what it does, what it doesn't do, what it can and what it can't do. And so that really highlighted uh, for me, the need for us to do more education, outreach, and training to all of the stakeholders in the DBE world because um, if they don't know and, they, they, and their expectations are unrealistic because they don't know, it just uh, creates a problem. A very common comment I read was, you know, NDOT should change is 3% set aside to some other number. And I just laugh because we don't have a set aside. Pick a number, any number you want. We don't have any set asides. But a lot of people out there believe that we do. And they commented on it, how we need to change our 3% set aside. And then um, there were a lot of comments about uh, they thought it was wrong that we didn't include uh, veterans, disabled veterans, and the disabled in general in the DBE program. Not our call. It's a federal program that's based on the uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And those of you familiar with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 know that it was concerned about discrimination against racial minorities and women. And that's so the DBE program, which is a direct uh, outgrowth from Title VI, uh, is only for racial minorities and women. There are other programs that we participate in that um, assist the disabled community and the veteran community, but it's not a part of the DBE program, and we can't decide to bring them into the DBE program. It's a federal rule, federal law. We, we, just, we take what they give us, and then we administer it. We don't have any control over those kinds of things. So um, with that, I'll uh, stop for any questions or comments. Are there any questions from any members? Any members on the phone? Okay, Dr. here. Thank you for your presentation. It was informative. Um, I guess my comment would be, you talk about the DBEs that didn't take advantage of the workshops, it was disappointing. And that um, there appears to be a consistent pattern of non-participation with the DBEs. And, um, and how what information is out there is misunderstood between Title VII and Title VI and all of that. Um, and I often think about that because I have to, we deal with several programs in the school district and there's so, so much uh, information that often gets, number one, people don't understand or what they do understand is, is not complete. Um, and, and I'm just thinking how do we really do that outreach because it's kind of like a vicious circle. I mean, it, is. it just keeps going circular. And um, if, if we as a board, SNCC board, can't get the 
people to understand as well, then we're not, some kind of way, we're all falling off the cliff here. Uh, I guess that's my, my, my comment. Um, and I was just thinking of how do we do that and get that, and you're understaffed, I get that, and so it's just about everybody else. Um, I, I, just one more comment. I'm, I'm thinking of a primer, a small, very, very simple primer without getting too complicated or convoluted. For lack of a better word, it's like um, um, this whole process in a very low-key, down-driven way that even your third grader or second grader could understand. You know what I'm trying to say? Yes. Uh, something user-friendly, because even with DBEs and WBEs and all your acronyms and so forth, it will run a bunch of people away. And then when you, when you talk about your, your title programs, which is good, we have to know that. How do we make it so that it's friendly that I could pass out to someone on the street or someone anywhere or in the churches so that they could understand and get the information in five minutes? I call it my um, supermarket syndrome that I can explain to you by the time we're standing in the supermarket before we check out what everything is about. And if I can't do it within the two to three minutes on the checkout, it's over most people's head because they're in survival mode and they've got to get home. So, I, I, and we deal with this all the time in the school district. We, how do we get information very quickly, user friendly, but enough where people can grasp the concept and then kind of move forward? It's just my thoughts on that. Those are excellent comments, and thank you very much for sharing them. We struggle daily with how do we get more information out and how do we get more participation. And I mean this sincerely, I am open to all ideas. We, um, we tried, we launched a program about a year ago called DEC, uh, which is DBE Empowerment Connections. And uh, we had a, a, a person who was uh, their sole job was to try to create and help build relationships between DBEs and the prime contractors. Because part of the challenge is that the prime contractors tend to use the same DBEs over and over again and not uh, provide opportunities for additional <coughs> DBEs. And some of them will say it and some of them won't, but we you know the same thing is happening that well, we don't really know that DBE, so we don't want to take a chance on them. So, so we're saying we want you to get to know them now when there's no bid uh, pressure so that you can get familiar with what they can do, they can get familiar with what your expectations are, and then when a bid opportunity comes up, you'll remember those firms and you'll ask them to provide quotes for those um, bid opportunities. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't produced much fruit. We've tried really, really hard. You know, the, the primes would participate. They'd say, yeah, we'll do an open house, bring us some DBEs, we'll meet them. And, and then, um, then not much really happened so far. So we're looking at any suggestions that uh, people have to help us make this work, because so far, Nothing is working very well. Thank you, Ms. Schumann. Um, maybe, you know, next meeting or you can send something. Um, or I know that it's probably the easiest thing to write something up, or I can even send something to you to write up, and then each board member can um, decide whether or not it's simplified through email, and then you send it out to your church pastor. That's one way to get it out. I mean, I know I send it specifically always to... Uh, a couple of churches, but um, we could probably try to help you simplify a message that's just what this particular new thing, the 24th, is about, and then try to get it out through our respective uh, churches or houses or whatever. So we really appreciate you coming and taking the time to explain this in detail. It was a lot of great information. Normally we've had, like, what, about 40, 30 people come to the meeting, and so... 
this time it's a light night, but that's okay, because I ended up advertising late um, on Facebook, so it's my fault. Anyway, so um, thank you, though. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and close um, the agenda and we'll open up for public comment. Is there anyone that has public comment on, you can, if any topic, um, I know Dr. T Dr. Tyler is here, though I don't know if you wanted to. I mean, you're not on the agenda, but I know that you turned in the grant and that we're waiting for the response. And so this is all great news. But in December, you'll be on the agenda when we actually have some more information. Go ahead. Come on, Mr. Evans. Uh, for the record, uh, Ken Evans with the uh, Urban Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much uh, for the detailed report, Ms. Schumann, uh, enlightening and it's information that uh, the Urban Chamber definitely appreciates and we'll do our part to help spread the word about the October 24th event as well, as well as any other related information. So what I'll offer up is that moving forward, the plan and intent is for the Urban Chamber to be a source of outreach or a mechanism for outreach as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any additional public comment? If I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there was a news, re um, a, what do you call this, press release put out today, um, and I'm hoping that we can get, again, trying to get public input. Uh, if you are, uh, if your church, if you have folks who live in the community along Maryland Parkway, uh, from Bonanza all the way down to um, past UNLV, the Regional Transportation is seeking input uh, on transit service and corridor improvements on Maryland Parkway. And if you know anyone who has a business or housing or a school, church, anything along Maryland Parkway, uh, the public uh, open house is going to be October 29th and 30th. <clears throat> that the one on the 29th will be at the Boulevard Mall, and the one on the 30th will be at the Bonneville, a beautiful Bonneville Transit Center uh, downtown. Um, I've been trying to talk to people about this. I know that the RTC has made a big push to um, talk to the businesses along the corridor, but I think that we also need to make sure that if we know people who live along the corridor, have churches along the corridor, schools, they too need to understand and get involved and give comment because this is going to affect um, the decisions that are going in this will have to do with transit, you know, sidewalks. Uh, do you want bu bike lanes, dedicated bus lane? How do you want to see traffic flow? Do you want to be able to walk with your kids? Do you care about that? Do you just want to drive fast down Maryland Parkway? So these are the things that we're trying to get information on, and we need input from folks. So please spread it to the regular folk. We want the regular folks to get comment. That's it for me. Thanks. All right. So no more comment? Uh, let, me that. That. let me restate that. Chandra wants the regular folk. I'm just, I'm telling you about it. But I would like to see, not the RTC, I can't speak for them. They need to see me to do this. I want regular folk to become more involved. There you go. Okay. All right. So we're going to, is there any comment on the phone? No, ma'am. No. Okay. So we're going to make, what happened? Yes, Dr. Brown? Just say no. Okay. Just say no. Not to me, thanks. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Um, I'm taking a motion on adjournment. We don't need one. Okay, I'm going to adjourn. All right, so we're adjourning this next meeting. Thank you for coming. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.